Let's talk about determining solute activity. And let's take one second to remember why. At this stage, there's been a pretty big edifice built of thermodynamic relationships and definitions, activity, activity coefficients. Where's it all going? So remember, the goal, the ultimate goal is to understand the chemical potential of a solute in solution. And I invoked a couple of videos ago the idea of bioavailability, for instance, and understanding how much of a drug might dissolve into solution. And it's because we know that that chemical potential, which is a free energy, will be at equilibrium with the free energy of a substance in other phases, maybe a solid, uh, certainly a gas, a vapor above the solution. And so we want to know what those free energies are, and we need to have a way to measure activity in order to compute those free energies. So now let's talk about how we actually measure activities. And in particular, how do we measure activities of solutes? So when we were looking at kind of liquid-liquid solutions, miscible in all proportions, we didn't really discuss how you'd do it in the laboratory, but it was kind of a given that there would be vapor pressures that you'd somehow be able to determine. But if we consider the solute to be a, a solid, for instance, and in not too long we'll actually consider the possibility of salts as solutes. Up till now I haven't really distinguished between what are called electrolytes and non-electrolytes. We'll get to that more later. The vapor pressure may be vanishingly small. And so if you have a solute that's not particularly volatile, how do you go about trying to measure the vapor pressure of that minority component above the liquid solution? The good news is we actually have a tool to allow us to do that. Namely, we know that the gibbs duhem equation, which we discussed in the last module, it's in video 10.2, allows you to relate the activity of both components of a solution, one to another, as they are changing. And so we can measure the activity of the solvent to begin. And how do we go about that? So I've actually tried to, to build a little device here. And the way you might build this device is, let's, let's work with water. It's the most easy solvent to imagine. So I'm going to take my device, and I'm going to put some water in it, and I'm going to plunge it into an extremely cold bath, liquid nitrogen, dry ice, whatever you like. I'm going to freeze the water solid. I'm then going to pull a hard vacuum on it before it has a chance to melt. So the vapor pressure is very, very low, and I'm left with this vacuum here. I got a vacuum over in this other tube, and I got some mercury in this tube, which is going to help me measure pressure. And now I let my water warm up and melt and come to whatever temperature I'm working at. It will volatilize, put some into the gas until there's an equilibrium in the chemical potential between the gas phase and the liquid phase. That'll create pressure on this side because it's still vacuum over here. And I can record the difference in the mercury levels. That's a measure of pressure. And now what I can do is I know the vapor pressure for the pure liquid water. I can look at how that vapor pressure changes as I start to put in a solute which itself does not have much vapor pressure. So I'm going to repeat my measurement, but now when I freeze it, I'm going to make a solid solution. I add a little bit of whatever my solute is. I freeze it down. I pull a vacuum. I let it warm up. Notice it's solution now. It's not pure water. And I'll have some different pressure associated with that. And I can measure how that pressure varies as a function of solute concentration. And so let's actually look at that now in, uh, in the context of some equations that will let us take advantage of the gibbs duhem equation. And in particular, let's, let's think about what I'm getting at. So I know from Raoul's law of behavior, I can measure the log of the activity of the solvent. Right? The activity of the solvent is the observed vapor pressure divided by the mole fraction times the pure vapor pressure. So Raoul's law gives me that it's going to be equal to log of the mole fraction. I'm then going to notice that by the relationship between the mole fractions of the two substances, log of mole fraction of the solvent is log of 1 minus the mole fraction of the solute. And because I'm working with very, very small mole fractions, the log of 1 minus x, in this case x2, is going to be equal, roughly equal to just plain old minus x2. And in the case of water, what is 
the mole fraction, when you plug it into the conversion between mole fraction and molality, it's going to be the molality divided by 55.51 moles per kilogram of water. All right, so however many moles there are per kilogram, and there's 55.51 moles of water in a kilogram. Okay. So that, uh, of course, I've said all these things. That's Raoul's law of behavior. That's because uh, X2 is very small, and that is because the uh, molality of this solution is so much less than 55.51, which is water, that uh, one gets away in this conversion very, very easily. So now what I want to do is I want to define another quantity. I'll call it little phi. And the deviation from unity of little phi quantifies the non-ideality of my solution. Right? So what I'm measuring, log of the activity, so I'm measuring this using this little vapor pressure tube, is going to be equal to minus m times phi over 55.51 moles per kilogram of water. So let's recall the gibbs duhem equation. It says that the number of moles of substance 1, which in this case is our solvent, times the change in the activity of the solvent is equal to minus the number of moles of solute times the change in the activity of the solute. For a dilute aqueous solution on a per kilogram basis, I know how many moles of water I have, 55.51. I'm monitoring how its activity is changing. It's going to be equal to minus the molality, so the number of moles in that kilogram of water is the molality, times the change in the solute activity. Now, on the last slide, we actually uh, defined m phi was equal to, m phi over 55.51 was equal to d log a1, sorry, was equal to log a1, so this d log a1 is, when multiplied times 55.51, is dm phi, okay? And I'll just expand out what is the activity of something, a solute. It is the molality times the activity coefficient in molality units. Now I'll carry through this differential. So I get m d phi plus phi dm. I will take apart this logarithm, m d log m plus m d log of the activity coefficient. So d log m is 1 over m. So I'll just get a 1 here, so uh, 1 over m times dm, of course. So here's 1 dm plus m d log, the activity coefficient. I rearrange the whole thing and collect terms because I want to solve for this. Right? That's been my goal here. I want to know what is the activity coefficient for my solute. So d log gamma 2m is equal to, when I collect these terms, d phi plus phi minus 1 over m dm. So that's an equation I can integrate. And in particular, if I integrate from zero molality, so I'll use m prime because that's what my integration uh, endpoint. So I start from nothing, in which case I have a Henry ideal case, and the activity coefficient, the log, the activity coefficient is one, and the log is zero. And I take it to some actual physical molality, m then I will be able to compute the values of the activity coefficient. So let, let's just actually see that. Okay? Namely, I'm going to start at zero molality, so that's at unit activity coefficient. I'm going to go to some value. So when I evaluate that integral of d log of the activity coefficient, I get log at this uh, endpoint minus log at that endpoint, but log of 1 is zero. So I, I just get the actual log of the activity coefficient. Integrating d phi is certainly easy. I need to go from 1 to phi. And integrating this quantity, I'm integrating over m, 0 to m. I know the molality. So here are the actual steps. That, that equation may not look completely obvious. But first, measure the solvent vapor pressure as a function of solute molality. Now that you know that vapor pressure and you know the pure solvent vapor pressure, you can compute the solvent activity. From that activity, determine what the deviation is in the solute activity. Okay, so we determine phi sub m because we're looking at how the solvent activity is deviating from ideal behavior. In order to solve this integral, we really want to express that phi probably as a polynomial in molality. So I'm adjusting the molality up and I'm looking at how phi is changing. 
So fit it to a convenient function, and then use that fit in order to write this integral in some explicit form. And so remember that the chemical potential of the solute is chemical potential in the standard state plus RT log the activity, and we're breaking apart in molality. We'll express activity as molality times activity coefficient. We pull all of this out, and here's the term that's varying. We know this by construction, how much we put in, and here's what we want to know is changing, so we know how the free energy of the whole system is changing. And this is the free energy associated with that hypothetical standard state where it would be one molal with nothing interaction, interacting, which we would get from extrapolating the zero, near zero molality behavior. Okay, so uh, knowing that, here's just a, an emphasis that dissolution of a solute would continue then, for example, until this value mu2 is equal to the chemical potential of the pure solvent. Okay, and as I just said in, in words, but I'll, I'll write down here, this mu2 zero term, that's the chemical potential of that hypothetical one molal solution behaving as though it were infinitely dilute. Okay, so uh, I'm going to pause there and let you think about this question. What if the solute vapor pressure isn't zero? That is, it is having some effect on the measured vapor pressure in that device I had a little schematic of. What would you modify in order to determine accurate activity coefficients? So if you gave that some thought, you might have come up with the idea that maybe the thing to do would be to iterate. That is to uh, first assume that there is no such pressure, determine how things would happen, and then uh, correct for that extra pressure. And uh, that would be one viable approach and a, a sensible one. All right, that is the end of uh, this video. And next we will go on to talk about colligative properties and a particular colligative property freezing point depression.